Hi, this is Chris, the Guitar Amp Tech from Sydney, Australia. Today we'll be continuing our short series looking to the main contributors of tube amp sag. Do you like a lot of sag? Do you not like any sag? Do you even know what sag is? Luckily, by the end of this short series, you'll have a much better understanding of tube amp sag and whether you like it or not. If this sounds like something you're interested in, go grab yourself a coffee, pull up a chair, and let's get stuck in. Let's do a quick recap on our rectifiers. We'll start off by looking at the solid state rectifiers, silicon diodes, and how incredibly efficient they are. They have very little voltage drop across the diode itself. If we look at this uh, very popular 4007, we'll see that the forward voltage drop, VF, is only 1.1 volts. Let's remember this as the mm, gold standard or wooden standard, depending on whether you like SAG or not. It doesn't drop any voltage at all, and it'll hold that. This tiny voltage drop tells us that if there is any SAG, in an amp with a diode rectifier, it ain't coming from the diode. But tube rectifiers are different and need a closer examination. To look at the voltage drop in tube rectifiers, let's take a look at the data sheets for each of the main tube rectifier types. Frustratingly, the data is not always given in a standard manner and you need to do a bit of searching. And while we look for the voltage drop in the data sheets, we will also look at a couple of other specifications that we should keep in mind. From the previous video, you'll understand how a filter capacitor can appear as a short circuit at startup. So we will need to look at the maximum allowable capacitance of the first stage of filtering after the rectifier. Secondly, the rectifier tube demands a lot of the five volt winding in the power transformer. This means we should proceed with caution and knowledge before we go swapping out rectifier tubes. You may notice that I like to confuse you by sometimes saying heater current, other times saying filament current. Come closer. I'm going to tell you a secret. Promise you won't tell anyone else who is not a subscriber to the channel. Go on, promise. Okay. Filament current and heater current is the same thing. Thirdly, we're going to look at directly or indirectly heated cathodes. These vary amongst manufacturers, so we will stick to the RCA data manual where possible. If a cathode is also the filament in the tube, then we say it is directly heated and the tube will conduct very quickly. While this is not a bad thing, I prefer the slow heating of an indirectly heated cathode, which has a separate cathode and filament. The hot filament has to then heat the cathode before it can start emitting electrons towards the plate. I like a slow startup because it can reduce that inrush current we've been, we've been talking about. And it, that will depend on, on what side of the standby switch the capacitors are placed, but We'll, we'll look at that later. Let's start with the 5Y3 data sheet. While we're looking at the data sheets, we're also going to have a look at the voltage drop. So we're looking at direct indirect heating, the heater current itself, the maximum capacitance and the voltage drop. That's quite a few things we can find just from looking at the data sheet. Okay, 5Y3. 5Y3, we can see that here, the filament is also acting as the cathode. That means it's going to heat up very fast. It's called direct heating cathode. Now, the heater current up here, the filament current, it's five volts. So it's going to have a separate five volt wadding on the transformer and it's going to be drawing two amps. That's the next thing we're looking at. Let's have a look at our maximum capacitance. Okay, and in this data sheet, it's showing the, uh, with the capacitor input filter, there's also um, a choke you'll see sometimes, but with the capacitor input filter, the most common type, we're going to see that this data sheet says a 10 microfarad maximum capacitance for our first filter capacitor. 
And let's look at voltage drop. This can be put in a couple of ways. Uh, DC output voltage, this is a common value we would find with a 5Y3, 390 volts. So we can see here that there is a half load to full load current drop of approximately 40 volts on a 5Y3. 5U4. Now let's have a look at the schematic for that tube itself and we will see that it is a directly heated cathode. The filament is also the cathode. So a 5 v 4 will heat up very fast. Now let's see if we can find the filament uh, current. It's not in the chart. This time we've got to look in the text. As I said, it's, it varies where you find this data. Frustrating at times. Once again, needs a 5 volt supply, 5 volt AC. But this time, I've drawn right through it, uh, it's a 3 amp uh, filament current. That's 50% more than um, the 5Y3. Now, maximum capacitance. Uh, got a little table here. Uh, look, the, mac uh, the maximum DC voltage we normally see in a guitar amp would be, say, 430. Uh, it's got to be somewhere around here, probably closer to here than there. So um, it's going to have a maximum capacitance of 40 microfarads. And it's going to have a voltage drop of somewhere between 45 and 60 volts let's say something like 55 volts we'd be seeing because we're running a little bit lower than that to the 5ar4 now let's have a look once again they're drawing ah excellent here we can see what an indirectly heated cathode is here we can see the filament and the cathode share a common line here on pin 8 but you can see here that the filament has to heat up first before it heats up the cathode, which is what then will um, start emitting the electrons. So this is a slow startup. I like slow startup. Heat a current. Let's see if we can find that heat a current. Here we go. 1.9 amps. Look at that. It is lower than a 5Y3. Okay, let's have a look at its capacitance. Um, I cut this in from another data sheet because this data sheet didn't have it at all. But maximum condenser, another word for uh, capacitor, is 60 microfarad. Okay, so let's keep that one in mind. And what else are we looking for? Voltage drop. Tube voltage drop down here. 17 volts. So we can draw a pretty good conclusion from the 5AR4 because it has the lowest of the voltage drops of any tube rectifier we've looked at and a highest, the highest uh, filter capacitor. We would think that a 5AR4 GZ34 it has the capacity of being the stiffest, if you want to use a negative term, I prefer punchiest, of the rectifiers that we've looked at so far behind a silicon diode. I've made a bit of a summary for you on what we found out with those rectifiers. We can see here in this little table, I've got rectifier, the maximum safe capacitance for that rectifier, typical DC volts for it, um, expected voltage drop that we can see, you know, refresh your memory, diode, one volt drop. Uh, the last one we looked at, 5AR4, 17 volt drop. Highest ones are 5U4 and 5Y3. The filament current, um, diode, man, it saves us totally on that five volt line. Um, I forgot to look at an EZ81. Oh, anyway, it draws one amp, um, but it's a 6.3 filament voltage compared to the 5 volt voltage, and it has a 25 volt drop. Uh, where do we see the EZ81? EZ81, uh, we see that in um, quite often smaller amps like a Vox, we might see it there, or um, 
Uh, my new Marshall 18 water, it's also got an EZ81. And here I've got the direct indirect heating of the cathode. And you remember from a few minutes ago where we said direct heating is where the filament is also the cathode. Indirect is where the filament heats up first, then it heats up the cathode before the rectifier starts doing its job. And the diode needs nothing, so it is effectively instant. But do you want rectifier sag? There is a romantic mystery around rectifier sag. But be careful of what you wish for. To have that beautiful bloom of a note that recovers from voltage sag, we pay the price with lost immediacy of the fast note which quickly follows the sag note. Sag can cause a loss of punch, but it pays back with that beautiful bloom as the vol voltage recovers. But I doubt you'll find many fast players jazz, metal players, or rockers chugging out palm-muted chords would want any rectifier sag, but it would be welcomed by many blues players. <sighs> well, a question I get asked regularly. Now that's an exaggeration. A question I've been asked twice is can you make a diode rectifier sag to emulate a tube rectifier? The simple answer is yes. The more complex answer is almost. So we'll stay with the simple answer and have a look at how to do that. Let's call this current flowing out of our bridge rectifier, silicon bridge rectifier. We're gonna call that our quiescent current, our steady state, no signal current. IQ. So we'll just come up with some value. These are just made up values, so don't design something based on these values. We're going to call our quiescent current, our steady state current, 80 milliamps. That'll give us 40 flowing into each one of those two tubes in this class AB push pull amplifier. And let's say, for example, we're going to call our I max maximum current. Let's call that, let's say it's an extra 100 milliamps. So let's say that goes to 180 milliamps. That means we've got a change in current, delta means change, of 100 milliamps. Okay, now um, we've got this voltage, this resistor here. Uh, which we've put in series with our bridge rectifier. And let's say we want to drop, say 20 volts. So we want to do a voltage, 20 volts, but it's going to be the change in voltage that we want to look at, because there will be a voltage drop before that voltage uh, current goes up. So we've got a increase in voltage drop of 20 volts. So we got Mr. V equals IR or R equals VI. R equals uh, 20 divided by our change of um, 100 milliamps, which is 0 0.1 of an amp. So that's R divided by 0.1, sorry, V divided by 0.1, which is 200 ohms. Now there's no such resistor as 200 ohms as far as I know, so let's call it 180 ohms. So we're going to put a 180 ohm resistor there in series. So quiescent voltage drop, because there's always current flowing through there. So voltage drop quiescent is... 80 milliamps, which is 0.08, times uh, 180 is 14.4 uh, uh, volts. We've got uh, the maximum voltage drop across there, which we'll call the M, is uh, 180, uh, which is 0.18 times 180 ohms, that's a bit confusing, 
And that is uh, 32.4. So that means our change in voltage drop is our delta V. So we're just double checking that is 32.4 minus 14.4, which equals 18 volts. Now, we planned on 20. How come we only got 18? Well, the reason is because we changed our resistance here from 200 ohms, because I said I couldn't find a 200 ohm resistor, into 180 ohms, hence the 18 volt. But notice the price we pay for doing this resistor. That means even the quiescent voltage, we're going to see a reduction in B plus of 14.4 volts less with nothing going through it. So we're going to lose some B plus. That is not always a bad thing. Sometimes we just need to drop that B plus. This is a convenient way to do it. And, um, you know, we're going to also simulate a little bit of sag if that's what we want. Now, before we go putting in our 180 ohm quarter watt resistor in there, let's just check what wattage we're going to need. So we're going to use our P equals I squared R formula. And we're going to say our I squared, it's, it's not 100, right? Remember our maximum current is now going to be 180. So over here 180. Um, so 0.18 squared times 180. It's 5.8 watts. Would we put in the 5 watt resistor? No. No. We're going to put in a 10 watt resistor. And because it's going to get stinking hot, we're going to mount that away from anything else uh, and in a such a way that we'll get a good airflow, air circulation around it. So if we use a 180 ohm resistor at 10 watt, then um, we're going to see a drop of 20 volts, a dynamic change of 20 volts, um, emulating sag of 20 volts. If you want to do more, double the resistor, etc., etc. But you know how to do the math now. Hopefully I've explained that well enough. So let's now revisit filter capacitors and their effect on SAG. Filter capacitors and rectifiers are a double act. One influences the other as you play your guitar. Let's take another look at the full wave rectified DC signal. This time, let's look at it after a solid state rectifier. Now here's our full wave rectified signal after a silicon rectifier. This level here is our maximum B plus. So let's add a filter capacitor. Let's make it a small one. Let's um, put in a 20 microfarad at idle. We got this amount of ripple here. Let's just pull that away. It's not looking too bad, is it? So at idle, not too bad at all. But uh-oh, here comes a big open E chord, the arms swinging around windmill style like Pete Townsend. Down the air comes and bang, we've got a sudden huge demand of power. And that silicon rectifier isn't going to give an inch 20 microfarad with a big Pete Townsend open E chord. That's going to be a horrible big 100 hertz buzz in Australia. You may, you may recall from chapter two that 100 hertz is somewhere between a G and a G sharp. And that's just not going to sound good against any note we play in the Western scale. What about in the US? Remember 120 hertz? That was between a B flat and a B. Once again, nothing is going to sound good against that. So how do we guard against that? 
How do we stop that huge ripple? Well, we add more capacitors. Marshall uses the double capacitors with two 50 microfarad capacitors linked together, giving us 100 microfarad as the first filter cap. This is followed by a second one of 100 microfarad and a third one of 100 microfarad and more and more and more. So masses of huge capacitors. And what does this do for us? At our big Pete Townsend, huge open E chord, we've got now 100 microfarad as our first filter capacitor and we're back to having minimal ripple, which is acceptable. Some people have called silicon rectifiers, big capacitors, sterile. I call that out as bull. Nobody is going to call that power supply sterile when Hendrix, Page, Clapton, Blackmore created history with a solid state rectifier and big capacitors. The sound is tight, it's firm, it's punchy. During the palm mute chug chug, it's going to push the audience off their seats. That's exactly what Friedman, Marshall, Messer want. They use solid state rectifiers with huge capacitors. They also have huge heavy transformers, which will tolerate that repeated inrush current demanded by those huge capacitors. So let's go and put a 100 microfarad capacitor on a tube rectifier. I know. Wait, uh, do you remember we spoke about tube rectifiers not liking big capacitors as their first capacitor because it looks like a short circuit? Uh, yeah, well, one of those Marshall capacitors would send any tube rectifier off to see its maker, Lord Mullard. So what about smaller filter capacitors on tube rectifiers? So if we were stuck with a small 20 microfarad rectifier like on a 5Y3, um, you'd, ex you'd be excused for thinking that we would have a horrible 100 hertz ripple causing ugly overtones on everything we play. No, not really, because unlike a rock solid, solid state diode rectifier, a tube rectifier will drop its voltage when we instantly demand more of it. Have a look at what I'm talking about. So let's now look at the case of a tube rectifier with a small 20 microfarad capacitor on it. It's going to look very similar to the um, uh, silicon rectifier at this point. But then along comes Pete Townsend. His arm's winding up. You know he's going to hit a big cranking E chord, big open E. And unlike the silicon rectifier, the tube rectifier is going to drop its voltage. You remember the um, little table I showed you with voltage drop of the different rectifiers? Well, here's what it's going to look like. Long comes Pete Townsend with his big open E chord, makes contact with the strings, and the voltage drop of that tube rectifier suddenly plummets. The ripple is not too bad. So the rectifier DC and the capacitor voltage will go down together to minimize the exposing of the full wave rectified DC hum. This is an excellent example of SAG. It's a balancing act of the plate voltage versus the 100 Hertz ripple. If the capacitor was too large, it would either blow the rectifier or its reservoir would charge, would try and hold the voltage more stable and resist the voltage drop. But even in a tube rectifier situation, a too small filter capacitor, one that's near its end of life, will still expose that ripple. And this is the 100 hertz hum that a good tech will listen out for before he breaks the bad news to you of a cap job. Now, I think before we wrap up, we should discuss the consequences of swapping out tube rectifiers in your search for your ideal tone. As we discussed, it will increase or decrease your B plus voltage. This in turn 
will affect the bias of your power tubes. If you were one of those thousands of believers in Randall Smith's myth that Mesa Boogie amps do not require biasing, you should now pop your fingers in your ear and sing la 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 la. Or else you will suffer from lightheadedness and the internal conflict of beliefs requiring psychotherapy. This truth applies to both fixed bias, like the large offenders and marshals, etc., or cathode bias stamps, like Voxes and all of their spin offs, and some of the tweeds and small offenders. Changing the B plus will most likely change the current through a tube and the dissipation, which is the voltage across the tube from the plate to the cathode, not plate to ground, plate to cathode, multiplied by the current going through the tube. So if you go from a 5Y3 to a GZ34 without adjusting the bias, there is a very good chance you'll either overheat or perhaps even red plate your tube. Whew. You know what? I think that might do for our chapter four. In the next chapter, let's look at the effect of transformers. If you got something out of the video, could you please hit the like button and subscribe? And um, by doing so, you let YouTube know that I've been of service to you. I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter. We're getting really close to the end of learning about the truth about tube amp sag. See you next week.